Hello and welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the busy intersection of faith and reason. A lot of traffic as we are one day away from Thanksgiving here in the United States if you're watching us live. And of course you can reach us via email, Facebook, Twitter. You can go to the Magic Center website, especially if you've got a long weekend ahead of you. you can browse that as well as uh, CredibleCatholic.com as well, which is usually our base for our program. But we're using Father's latest book, Christ versus Satan, in our daily lives, the cosmic struggle, of course, between good and evil. It has to be cosmic. This is the universe. Father Spitzer's new book, of course, is now available through the EW10 Religious Catalog, all things Catholic, EW10RC.com. Another great book, Book of the Month, Toil and Transcendence, Catholicism in 20th Century America. Father Charles Connor, our great Catholic historian here on EWTN, one of the best. Always a great read. Check that book out through Religious Catalog. Now we turn once again to Father Spitzer and welcome to the show. Ask him for a prayer, a special prayer for a great friend of the network and a great friend of yours who unfortunately is down yeah. with COVID. So if you want to mention her, we'll take you a bet. look at her picture as well. Perfect. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you today to watch out over our country, watch out over our culture and our church. We um, ask especially that you send your Holy Spirit down upon Doug, myself, uh, all of our audience members this day to inspire us, guide us, and protect us so that everything we do will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask you to bless Barbara McGuigan this day, very special friend of mine in the networks. Please, Lord, just bless her through her faith with great consolation and health and healing so that she can get through this COVID uh, uh, challenge um, with uh, great gusto and be back with us and doing her broadcasts as soon as possible back to her family, back to her friends. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And our Lady of Perpetual Help, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right. And a lot of people remember Barbara not only from her radio show, but uh, for years, actually, and that picture was taken when she was hosting our EWTN religious catalog. There she is on the catalog set mm -hmm. for a long, long time. And the first time I met her, she was a very big pro-life warrior, did a lot of pro-life work. Absolutely. I'm sure that's how you knew her, especially out in California, yeah. right? Yeah, and also through the radio program. So she uh, she's done several interviews with me on, on my new books and things of that nature. She got the good fight there, and right. and um, also uh, yeah, but definitely big pro life warrior and right. and still is. I mean, she's right. very very supportive indeed. Right. We want to be clear. Barbara's still with us. We're asking for prayer. So yeah. please uh, keep you her bet. and your family in your prayers, as you said. Now, as I mentioned, obviously uh, uh, we're doing this show on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, so I thought it would be appropriate if we talk about uh, an article that recently I saw, the Federalists actually okay. put out called, Socialism's Failed Miserably for the American Pilgrims, Just Like It Does Everywhere. And it mm -hmm. says, it's widely known that the early pilgrims came to the New World to escape religious persecution. What is lesser known is their spiritual adventure was also a commercial enterprise. And today's self-identified democratic socialists like to claim real socialism has never been tried in America but they need to brush up on their history because actually the pilgrims did try it out. And it goes on to say, although the word socialism hadn't been invented yet, the Plymouth colony bore many resemblance to a socialist society. Since investors back in England demanded that the colony operate communally, everything was owned by every colonist jointly. No one was allowed to have private business. And the communal mm -hmm. society economic structure proved a disastrous, not only for the colonists were willing to work hard, because they weren't willing to work hard for the commonwealth, for the common good. Now, you know, people hear about how tough it was and how starvation and stuff. The reality is part of mm -hmm. it was because of the nature of what was set up like this in the beginning. Oh, yeah. No, I, every time collectivization occurs, 
uh, we can see a direct, or I should say, an inversely proportional reaction. Uh, so in other words, as, as uh, collectivism or socialism increases where everybody owns everything in common, businesses are operated in common, overseen as it were by some kind of governmental structure, religious or secular. But the minute that happens, you have a decline in creativity, a decline in incentive, a decline in risk taking. And when you factor those three things together, a lack of creativity and risk taking and incentive, the moment you have that, you are going to have a failed system because you're not going to have the energy, you're not going to have the fortitude, you're not going to have the resilience, you're not going to have the, the courage that it takes to take the risk and, and, and move your capital into an environment where you have absolutely nothing to gain. Nobody has anything to gain. There's, there's, and once you've got that, all you have is sort of a, a very placid environment lacking creativity and incentive fortitude and that of course is a recipe for failure, always has been right. and we can see it in every Every single country uh, that it has occurred in, we see the, the, the inverse uh, 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 relationship there uh, to the three necessary ingredients to move ahead technologically, to move ahead in terms of commercial enterprise, to move ahead in terms of hiring and labor, to move ahead in the increase in, in what Adam Smith would call the wealth of nations. Right. So very, very uh, typical. Um, uh, to see this kind of a reaction, but um, uh, we should be able to know by now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, who was it? The, uh, Einstein said, right? And the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. Right. Exactly. They mentioned this article. After turning the communal property into private property, letting everyone be responsible for themselves and their own families, well, being Bradford, who was the governor at the time. Yeah. Noted the drastic changes in all the colonists' behavior. He said these hardworking, motivated colonists turned Plymouth Colony into one of the most successful colonies in North America. So suddenly, yeah. when people could see their personal reward for their personal motivation, it changed exactly. things. You know, it's also exactly. interesting here because we always talk about the Indians and and the indigenous people. Squanto to the rescue is the article, but this was interesting. Squanto was yeah. no ordinary native. Early settlers in 1610 had captured him, actually and sold him into slavery. A group of Catholic friars, I didn't know this, freed him and brought him to England where he learned to speak English. In 1618, serving as an interpreter on an English ship, he was brought back to the New World, and he's the one who really taught the pilgrims how to plant and fish and even brokered a peace treaty. So there you can see oh, a, wow. a, 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 a situation where the church's stance against slavery in whatever form was being lived yeah. out. Oh yeah, no, there's no question. And of course, the church had for uh, centuries been against slavery, uh, issuing no less than uh, 10 different encyclicals uh, or bulls uh, against slavery in slavery in the colonies, slavery against black people, uh, you know, slavery uh, against the the natives in the Canary Islands, and of course uh, against slavery in general uh, across the world. And, and that not only includes the papal encyclicals and bulls, but all of the uh, the attempts that the church made, uh, the Congress of Vienna and a variety of other places, uh, in order to get slavery to to put it to an end. Um, and so, yes, the, the Catholic Church has been right in the forefront of the abolition of slavery internationally, no question. Absolutely. Okay, so we, uh, we keep that in our mind while we uh, have Thanksgiving here in the United States, which you bet. Uh, likewise to all those people around the world watching on EWTN on whatever platform you happen to be watching us on. Let's get to some questions. We've had a lot going mm -hmm. on, and some people have some concerns about certain things we've said over the last few weeks, so okay. let's... Uh, Let's uh, sure. own up to them and, and deal with them as best sure. we can. First one's on me. Dear Father Spitzer, on a recent show, Doug said that one of the female visionaries of Fatima had an affair that resulted in an abortion that she would spend her eternity in purgatory. Let me be clear. I never said huh? it was the visionary. The, the yeah, thing was absolutely. the person being talked about who our Blessed Mother mentioned, who the, who the visionaries yes. had asked about, was another girl from from the area she was the That's one right. that was being discussed not lucia or any of the other children involved not yeah. just cinta and certainly not francisco so it was about mm -hmm. another person not about uh one of the visionaries second of all just and we you can go through the explanation about the fact that one would never spend eternity in purgatory the yeah. issue was spending until the end yeah. of time now this person goes yeah. to say 
If true, where does that leave mothers of aborted babies who have repented and confessed their sin when they die like the visionary Fatima, which again, I noted was not what we said. They have no yeah. chance of going to heaven because of the sin they confess to Linda. So I think there's a couple of things that we've clear. It wasn't the visionary. Yeah. Second of all, it seems to be a little bit of a misunderstanding of purgatory and what its function is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, purgatory is def definitely temporal. It's not eternal, and you did not say that it was eternal there, Doug. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, the end of time, of course, uh, uh, that is a very temporal or finite uh, measure. So yeah, of course, uh, if, if if purgatory were eternal, that mm -hmm. that, that would be um, <laughs> a whole different matter. But it is not. It's a temporal period. It's a, a restricted, finite mm -hmm. period of time, and uh, once that is completed then, of course, you move on to the heavenly kingdom. So uh, I don't think your question really follows because, mm -hmm. of course, uh, uh, since purgatory is temporal, everybody is, who you know for, uh, asks for forgiveness for, for even the well, sin of abortion and asks sincerely and makes a firm purpose of amendment mm -hmm. uh, is going to be able to get into heaven through the mercy of Christ well. Jesus our Lord. Right, and a sense of this you get is that depending upon your state in life at the time that you die, uh, yeah. There may be levels of purification one needs to go through. Some yeah. people go directly. Sure. Some people have a, would have very little, yeah. and others. And in this case, mm -hmm. at least in an understanding yeah. to the children's understanding, you know that this was yeah. a person who needed greater purification, maybe because of some of the sins they committed in their life. That's correct, and that's correct, and it could could uh, easily <laughs> Well, probably very easily happened to me. I mean, I'm sure that I will have some purification required. Uh, people who know me uh, uh, will uh, certainly uh, vouch for that. And so, uh, in any case, I, I have to say that um, that um, yeah, these this is uh, our state in life. We right. uh, oftentimes do not die uh, perfect or capable of perfect love. So we do need some form of purification, and the Lord takes care of that and and helps that to occur and helps us right. along the way. Uh, we have to let go of what we're attached to, and that sometimes is very challenging, difficult, could even be painful. Right. But, um, but at the end, there is heaven, and that's the promise of Jesus Christ. Right, and also I would think, and I would ask you, obviously the whole idea of time, and what does that yeah. actually mean when you're talking yeah. about time in purgatory? Well, I mean, the only thing we can say is, you know, is this physical time? Is this another kind of time? Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, some sort of temporality there, right, because uh, it is not uh, the eternal now. Mm -hmm. So we have to assume that there is some sort of temporality. But what that succession uh, is, mm -hmm. uh, is like, uh, we really do not know. I mean, obviously, right. there's no, you know... Uh, uh, you know, is it like uh, physical time in, in this universe? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But is it, uh, you know, is it a before and after, an earlier, later, a succession? Oh, probably so, because mm -hmm. it's not an eternal now. Right. Uh, therefore, I'd have to say it's some sort of a temporal succession. So, um, but what, what exactly it is, uh, none of us knows. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for that uh, opportunity to clarify, as we will for all the uh, questions mm -hmm. that come to us. We want to make it clear to people so that there's no yeah. misunderstandings. Dear Father sure. Spitzer, there are a lot of calls for the excommunication of Catholic politicians who promote abortion. My understanding is that an excommunicated Catholic is not kicked out of the church. They're still required to attend Mass on Sundays, though not receive communion and follow and support the church and our teachings. We should pray for them in hopes they will someday return to co full communion with the church. Now, is my understanding mm -hmm. correct? This is Carol. Yeah, Caroline, your understanding is pretty much correct. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and that's why we ought to keep praying for them that they come back exactly as you say into full communion with the church. That's the correct understanding, and that's what we would want um, uh, to to happen. And of course, with full communion, uh, there is not only you know their salvation, their mm -hmm. uh, salvation being vouchsafed, but also that they will stop undermining, uh, as it were, the mission right. of Christ and the mission of the church. Very good. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, on a recent show you mentioned that St. John Paul II may have been too trusting of subordinates in appointing Thomas McCarrick, or Theodore McCarrick, to his mm -hmm. post in Washington. How were bishops actually appointed? Surely the Pope cannot know each man personally, but shouldn't candidates be more closely vetted before given an appointment to such a high rank as bishop? And this is Ryan. Uh, well, Ryan, here's my, my thought. 
um, you know, there's only so much the Pope can know personally. Mm -hmm. And as I said, he had two different vectors of information coming in. One vector, uh, which was sort of the minority vector, was saying, watch out for this guy. Mm -hmm. There are rumors. Now, John Paul, you know, uh, who is just a wonderful man, uh, <laughs> had to grow up uh, in the... Um, in, in communist um, uh, Poland where rumors were fabricated on a daily basis to undermine anybody in the church. Right. So uh, first of all, St. John Paul was uh, pretty much skeptical, pretty much not trusting of rumors. And that's how it was contextualized. There are rumors that this guy is doing things. And I think St. John Paul's reaction to that, well, there are rumors and there are rumors. However, John Paul decided not to appoint him uh, as cardinal. Then, uh, you know, uh, slightly later, maybe about two weeks uh, have elapsed, and some bishops came forward and said, this guy looks like he's perfectly okay. And of course, then came the, the crescendo, right, where Cardinal McCarrick, uh, well, at that time, uh, uh, Archbishop McCarrick uh, basically said, I am going to swear that, you know, the, all right. these allegations are completely false. So he gives John Paul sworn testimony. And John Paul really actually believed it. I mean, mm -hmm. I think he, he really did. Uh, he thought he was a man of his word. Uh, he wouldn't swear uh, before God if it were false. And he believed these other bishops, and so he had doubts. So he rescinded uh, the order not to appoint and actually let the appointment go through. Mm -hmm. So you, you look at that and you go, would we have more careful vetting procedures today? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Would we look for evidence today? Absolutely. Would we investigate the rumors to the hilt today? Yes, absolutely. But in those days, it was a much more naive period of time. And, and uh, you know, a sworn statement from somebody right. seemed to have meant something. And, and uh, you know, the words of these other bishops seemed to have meant something. And, and you know, John as I said, St. John Paul knew that a lot of rumors meant nothing. Mm -hmm. So he went in that direction, but it was much more informal. Today, we do not have any of those informalities. We mm -hmm. are much more formal and much more thorough. Right, absolutely. And you're, you're talking in a situation there, too, which I think We've uh, learned me, lesson, uh, yeah. with society today, there used to be some mm -hmm. sense that when people were caught in a lie or a falsehood, at some point mm -hmm. they would sort of own up to it. Today, people don't do that. They don't feel any obligation, for the most part, to not just continue to lie, as if somehow yeah. that's perfectly fine. Yeah, and I think, frankly, it's there are some personalities right. that are compulsive liars, and they're either even ones that are pathological liars. And I'm not sure whether uh, Cardinal McCarrick was in that group, but you know, there's uh, at least strong evidence that mm -hmm. points in that direction that he may have even been a, a pathological yeah, liar. And, right, not and, a sociopath you know, so, in his own way. Right? Yeah, no, 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 but I mean, just like he just couldn't help himself. You know, he just sort of, you know, had done it all his life. And, right. And uh, you can say, well, how could a cleric be a compulsive liar? Because. Right. They're very good at it. I mean, and, and as I said, it was a more naive period of time, a more trusting period of time. And, uh, you know, um, and, uh, and a lot uh, of these people can be made and you know, indeed were made. Right, right. And I would think sometimes, even in these situations, people have convinced themselves, whether it's because of their, he's a sociopath and he doesn't stand right from wrong, but this almost mm -hmm. excusing of whatever they've done as if, well, it wasn't really that. It really was less than that it's really mm -hmm. not a problem yeah and they just can't yeah. own up to actually what they've done well the compulsive liar right. absolutely does rationalize it off yeah and um, and does minimize it and a variety of other things that right. go through their mind and of course we understand a lot of that now because we we have very good studies on addictive behavior <clears throat> so we know that drug addicts alcoholics etc have a series of um, rationalizations, um, including uh, right. sexaholics, I guess you could call them, sexual addicts. Mm -hmm. um, and they use the same uh, rationalizations. Uh, it's a denial process. <clears throat> goes through the reticular activating system. It becomes very compulsive at some stages where the lie is just coming out of their mouth mm -hmm. <clears throat> before there's any reflectivity going on. 
So right. <clears throat> these are the things that we deal with. And um, now today we, we have a, a much better understanding of this than we did back then. Right, absolutely. But at the same time, we should be also asking questions going forward about the people who surrounded him at the time, who may still be around, who my guess is had some better insights into maybe his personality than some of those well, above who didn't have such a great view. But that, I'll just say that. They would have to answer to the Lord. Right, exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing. Let me ask you that question, too. And it's come on, I hate to be off on. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when you see these things and you see people, you know, men of the cloth, let's just say, who you would think have this relationship with our Lord, they're dedicated to life, et cetera, do these things mm -hmm. that seem to be blatantly wrong and immoral. And you say to yourself, how could they do this knowing they're going to face the Lord? Is it that they just don't believe they really will have to face the Lord or what? Well, it's so hard to know because you'd have to get into the other person's mind, but I know there are some um, uh, psychological profiles of addicts mm. that could provide some insight. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, obviously the, the state of what's called compartmentalization is, is what takes place. And, uh, in, in, for example, in, a, in an alcoholic, they compartmentalize what's going on in their family and, and put in a completely different compartment what they're doing uh, with having, you know, 20 drinks before they come home. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's, uh, they, they're not making these associations between those compartments. Mm -hmm. and, and what winds up happening is uh, because of the lack of association, which is part of the whole negative screening process that goes on through the, the reticulation activating system um, basically they mm -hmm. they wind up not really thinking about it that's the best mm -hmm. way of putting it and so in in a way uh, now today there are psychological tests that can sort of program for that sort of behavior mm -hmm. and and they're designed to kind of catch people up uh, to see if they're in states of denial mm -hmm. or you know that they they are lying you know but you they ask the same question a variety of different ways right, right. and so forth and so on to kind of get underneath the fact is this person really lying about things or inclined to lie in general inclined to car compartmentalize data to be non-associative with data mm. and, and so forth and so on and if they do do uh, those kinds of things uh, then for um, right. all intents and purposes it's a real warning flag do right. not let that person enter. Right. Now, I can tell you, when I entered uh, the Society of Jesus in 1974, we did have a battery of psychological exams. Now, this is in, in 74, and uh, uh, they were all kinds of exams, right? The Minnesota Multiphase Personality Inventory, an artistic exam, a fill-in-the-blank exam. There were, you know, a whole bunch of them. You had a, a psychologist that was sort of reading uh, all of these things and trying to diagnose, mm. uh, you know, both the personality, the inclinations, et cetera. Now, prior to, I think, just maybe even prior to 1970, we were not giving any sort of psychological exam uh, like that. Mm -hmm. and, and today, the psychological exams are better, they're more proficient, the psychological interview is better, et cetera. Uh, in, in 74, we, we, I think the Society of Jesus was ahead of the game mm -hmm. uh, at that time and, uh, um, you know, did have those psychological exams. Eventually, uh, things caught up with it. There was also a very false belief, you know, relative to, uh, to uh, uh, pr people who were abusers, a false belief that that was really a curable uh, psychological disorder. But in point of fact, uh, it is really not a curable psychological disorder. And I actually was attending a lecture uh, that was being given to us when I was at, uh, teaching at Georgetown University there uh, in 1988. And uh, we had a, a lecture um, that, that we were all required to go to where mm -hmm. we were told by a psychologist, yeah, this is a curable disorder, you know, just get them over to this uh, clinic and, you know, this thing can be reversed and so forth and so on. And uh, of course, that was all wrong information. Right, so right. we have uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, no question about that. The church certainly has made its fair share of mistakes. Right. And uh, today, I think we are far, you know, especially after 2002, uh, which was uh, you know the Dallas uh, Charter, you know, uh, went through. Uh, since that time, we have been very circumspect, 
very much, uh, you know, looking for uh, outside sources to judge uh, behavior, mm -hmm. the reporting of behavior to criminal authorities, et cetera. This, you know, it's a it's a whole different ball game uh, uh, today. But uh, yeah, there was mm -hmm. a, a good deal of naivete and a good deal of ignorance, right. uh, and and that just uh, that was the condition. Uh, but prior to 70, when you don't even have a psychological exam mm -hmm. uh, that, that tests for these things, oh man, it was a setup for, for problems to happen on a grand scale. And of course, you know, the, the whole thing of, you know, uh, should you be loyal to, uh, you know, uh, people in the, in, in the priesthood or try yeah. to get them therapy and yeah, things like that. Yeah, clericalism basically, I mean, yeah, effectively yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. an understanding of yeah. what people mean by clericalism, yeah. where there's a protection yep. of the class, so to speak. Yep. Here's, a, yep. here's, here's another question. This one I think they got okay. around to. Looking for you to expand on a great answer you gave the last time. Dear Father Spitzer, during a recent discussion, mm -hmm. You had on birth control, you did not clarify that there is something in birth control pills that causes the lining of the uterus to be thin and therefore be unable to allow a fertilized egg to implant in the uterus. This makes birth control pills of abortifacients, which I know you mentioned, in certain circumstances. Please clarify this in your show that people are informed, Joan. So, Joan, I guess, wants well, okay. it to hey, uh, yeah, Joe, there are two. Guess, so. Right. Yeah, there, there are two kinds of birth control. Uh, thank you for the clarification uh, there, Joe. One is, is kind of a, what's called a prevention of conception, and that's a, a birth control pill that's designed uh, to prevent um, uh, conception from occurring. There's another kind of birth control pill, quote unquote birth control pill, which is really an abortifacient, which actually after conception occurs, it is designed uh, to uh, cause uh, that uh, conception uh, to be, uh, well, uh, to, to not uh, either attach or to uh, to um, cause the uh, uh, the the uh, conceived fetus mm -hmm. to be miscarried essentially, right. and so um, uh, that would be an abortifacient, and it is the killing of a, of a of a child because we believe right. that uh, that uh, from the point of fertilization there is uh, uh, no question um, uh, a real human right. being there with a unique uh, uh, human genome full unique human genome that. Uh, uh, will, you know, if, if not killed uh, under ordinary circumstances, be brought to conception as a unique human being. Right. Here's another question. Dear Father Spitzer, mm -hmm. you, re you recently stated that the church does not teach that limbo is a church doctrine, right? Maybe this right. is why right. parents no longer seem in a rush to baptize their infants, waiting often a year or more. And we talked a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. uh, not mm -hmm. about waiting a year or more. Should not infants yeah. be baptized right away to gain the benefits of the grace of baptism, Jenny? I know for myself, yeah. uh, I thought it was interesting because uh, the limbo, because there used to be, you know, let's say when I was born, there was this sense that you should get baptized within a week or something like that. There was a very quick turnaround, even to the point that sometimes children were baptized when mom was still in the hospital, so to speak. And that one of the reasons yeah. that, that got godparents there. And that now, uh, yeah. obviously, there doesn't seem to be quite that pell-mell rush, but certainly yeah. uh, sh nobody's talking about a year. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> that's for sure. But, Jenny, you're absolutely right. Yes, of course, the, the, the minute the baptism occurs, that's when the graces really do begin to happen. Uh, I am a very much an advocate of genuine religious experiences for children, even little children. I'm one of the ones that had my own little religious experiences, you know, my church. It wasn't visions or anything like that, but a, a real sense of God's love and a real sense of the sacred and the holy, uh, you know, I just pulled in a, a kind of a genuine love of the mass, even when I was in first grade, things of that nature. Uh, and I can remember that, uh, you, know, you know, almost palpably. So these things, um, yes, Jenny, I think mm -hmm. the, the quicker we, we get them baptized, the better for the, the full graces of the sacrament. The other thing, though, is, y y you know, even though we, we don't have, uh, you know, a, a real notion of uh, limbo as a doctrine today, I mean, there is still... Um, uh, you know, a sense of urgency. You want your child mm -hmm. to be brought into the mystical body. You want them to have the Holy Spirit. You want them to start that sense of inspiration, that protection, that guidance of the Holy Spirit that's uh, even, you know, there present. And you say, uh, in a nation to, you know, forming uh, brain and in a forming 
uh, you know, uh, human being because, of course, uh, as this occurs, uh, you know, you, you just don't know what effects those graces can have. Uh, you know, in, in that child. Just because the child doesn't reflect on it at that moment mm -hmm. or have a sense uh, at that moment or a word to identify, well, that's holiness or, or that's, you know, God loves me at that moment. It, the grace is still active. So we, yeah, of course, uh, get those babies baptized as soon as possible, but you don't have to do it because, uh, you know, to prevent them from going into limbo. Believe me, uh, if you don't have them baptized, and they die, and you, you, your intention was to have them baptized, you know, um, and, right. and they died before baptism. Of course, God is going, they're, in, they're innocent. God's going right. to bring them into the kingdom of heaven. Right. Let's just make sure we get the right consecration going on when they get baptism <laughs> so, so we don't have any yeah. problems later. Much more with <laughs> Father Spitzer as we continue your questions after this quick break. Stay with us. And welcome back to Father Spitzer's Universe, where we'll be talking about a topic that's based on Father's latest book. Let me make a pitch for it. Uh, Christ versus Satan in Our Daily Lives, The Cosmic Trouble Between Good and Evil, available through our EW10 Religious Catalog. That's what we're going through and will be over the next few weeks as we move ahead through Thanksgiving into the Advent season. Let's get to some other questions that people uh, are sure. looking for some clarification or Further explanation here, somebody writes, says, Dear Father Spitzer, you re recently categorized organ transplants as extraordinary procedures that a person need not mm -hmm. endure. As kidney recipient of 31 years with a teenage daughter who is a liver recipient, I would like to say that today these most common transplants are no more extraordinary than other major surgeries and have a better than 90% success rate. The real issue regarding transplantation is the lack of donors. Organ donation is a pro-life cause and in hopes of increasing donors, we have the saying, don't take your organs to heaven. Heaven knows we need them here. Thank you, Walter. Yeah, Walter, I'm, I'm right in your camp. I absolutely believe that uh, organ donation's fine. I, I've got my organ donor card. Uh, there's no question about it. I, I, I don't want uh, uh, my organs uh, being taken to heaven either. Of course, uh, uh, my eyes uh, might be interesting for, for science, but certainly not for medical purposes. But everything else is, 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 is available. Uh, you know, I, I am, I'm okay with it. But nobody has to do it, Walter. Right. Right. And, and the Catholic Church is not going to mandate that anybody must do it. So um, uh, th that's my point. You, you do not have to do it. Um, it would be good if you, in my opinion, if you did do it, but it's not necessary to do it. And it, it's a virtuous act, in my opinion, if you mm. want to generously uh, uh, give this over so that somebody else can have life or, or somebody else can have a, a well-functioning kidney or whatever the case may be. But at the same time, uh, there's no necessity for it. Uh, so that was my point, and right. I think actually you picked up my point. So, uh, um, and I, I, I'm not going to change my position on that. I think it's a great thing, but not necessary. And the church is taught, I think, very correctly in this regard. Right, and as you, as you, as you indicated, it's a question of, is this something you're obligated to do, like providing yeah. water yeah. and nourishment to somebody who's at the end of life or some situation like that? This would be right. go beyond that into some sort of extraordinary means, right? Right, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, uh, and a person, by the way, does not have to take an organ transplant. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I um, was probably talking about. I'm right. not talking about exactly. giving one. Right. I was talking about taking you a, an, an organ. Right. And uh, so for all intents and purposes, you certainly don't have to take an organ either. Right. Uh, that would be viewed as an extraordinary means. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Up next, no, thanks uh, for the clarification. dear Father Spitzer, here's another one. In a recent program, there was a question related to divorce and the worthy reception of communion. According to the Catechism, 
Divorce is a grave offense against the natural law. So would not divorce be a serious mortal sin for the person who initiates the divorce and require absolution? John, I guess the question is, there's some additional stipulation he put on the end of that. Why don't we talk about that concept? Yeah, well, John, uh, divorce in itself is, is and, and even the initiation of a divorce mm -hmm. um, is not necessarily a sin. Um, uh, now, it's the divorce and the remarry part uh, before uh, that um, marriage has been annulled. That's the problematic condition. Mm -hmm. Now, if you initiated a divorce, uh, in order for you to uh, get free from somebody you had a personality conflict with, well, that wouldn't be a good thing. And that could be borderline sinful mm -hmm. if you did that, as it were, for a, a kind of a malicious purpose or for a purpose of or paying somebody back. To abandon your back, children or, or, or something like that. To abandon your children, you know, exactly. Kind of exactly. Right. And then you would want to absolutely go to confession. That would not be good. That would be mm -hmm. sinful to do that. But if, for example, as is the case with most divorces, there is a situation of in, uh, incompatibility uh, where... Um, well, no, maybe not most divorces, but a lot of divorces where there's a situation of incompatibility mm -hmm. to the point where a person is being truly tormented mm -hmm. or physically abused or psychologically and verbally abused on a continual basis, et cetera, et cetera. When these kinds of things are occurring, you can get a divorce without uh, you know, uh, being a sin. The church and Jesus Christ is not asking that people remain in a, in a position where they're going to be uh, abused on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's not a sin, and divorce is not per se a sin. Uh, the, the, the church teaches that divorce, um, you know, that, uh, and then a remarriage without an annulment is sinful uh, uh, for sure, and sometimes a divorce can be sinful if it is done uh, to, to do something that is in itself sinful, abandoning the children or, right. you know, getting free from a spouse that you just have become bored with or, uh, you know, whatever, uh, you know, some, you know, cavalier thing where mm -hmm. you break up the family and the relationship for no good reason. But uh, generally, if there's a condition of abuse, if there's a condition mm -hmm. of uh, even verbal and, and psychological abuse on an ongoing basis, you are not expected to endure that uh, into, uh, uh, to, for the rest of your life. Uh, you, you can get some peace or relief from it. Now, I remember uh, years ago, uh, it used to be kind of thought of, well, Catholics don't get divorced. If there's a situation, they used to have something called a separation. Now, I don't know whether that was just yeah. a divorce with another name or what specifically that was, but mm -hmm. I, I do remember the well, term. Uh, yeah, a separation, um, uh, you know, is, is generally, it, it's a good first step. Uh, you know, if, let's, let's suppose you have a, a verbally abusive situation. The, the first thing to do is to get a separation to see if that person, you know, that let's suppose there was an abusing spouse, to see if that person will turn their lives around. Uh, you know, stop, you know, abusing uh, the other spouse, et cetera. So you don't want to legalize uh, the separation. You don't want to, uh, you know, have a court ruling on the separation mm -hmm. until uh, you're pretty sure that that person is just, you know, um, not going to uh, be able to, to turn around. Now, if it becomes clear, so for example, uh, you try to, to get some therapy for that person and they just say, I'm not interested in any therapy, or you meet with the person again, they go, I've done nothing wrong, you know, and I'm not gonna change one single thing, and right. so forth and so on, as often happens. And, and believe me, as priests, we can see a lot of these uh, situations that are going on where somebody is clearly uh, you know, almost oppressively abusive, mm -hmm. and, and so they claim that I'm, we're not doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, after a while, it becomes, you know, incumbent upon that person to, to um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to maybe take a stronger action. And, and at that point where you don't want that person to have recourse to your house anymore, you really want some protection of the law because you're afraid that they're going to come over, either hit the kids or hit, right. uh, you know, you, uh, things of that nature. When, once that begins to happen, then it's best to probably get get the uh, the court to uh, uh, to to make a proclamation, just simply, uh, you know, or, you know, a ruling that just simply says 
uh, this person can no longer come over, you have your own autonomy, uh, you know, and uh, they, they do not have free access to the kids, but they'll uh, abide by what the court rules on it. And I think, uh, in a way, um, you know, it's just, nothing's perfect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the courts, you know, it won't know absolutely perfectly. But generally, you're right, Doug, a separation prior to the divorce is always a recommended thing. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, uh, once the divorce happens right. and the legal ruling is there, it's much more difficult to reconnect again right. and get back together. Right, reconciliation is that much more difficult. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's why they have wonderful things like Marriage Encounter to help married that's couples right. uh, in, and also retrovive for those where there's severe damage Retro. in, in yeah. the relationship as well. Or both things you can check mm -hmm. out on the web and find out if, if you're interested. Let's move on to uh, your book here. Your new book is out, so I'm assuming it's selling like hotcakes. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's probably doing okay, thanks to uh, uh, you know the good coverage I'm getting on EWTN. There you go. Well, <coughs> I heard you on the radio with Teresa Tamio yesterday. There, talking oh yeah, about it too, right? yeah, so. that's right, that's right. Yeah, no, she's great. She she uh, she gave me a nice uh, long interview, and I probably ta turned everybody's ears into hamburger. So I doubt uh, it. anyway, <laughs> I think you uh, turned everybody's ear to want to read the book. So let's talk about the 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 book in the mm -hmm. section Christ versus Satan in our daily lives. You say in the book mm -hmm. here that the more we know about the moral teaching of Jesus and the church, the more we will understand ourselves, our true dignity, our destiny. And the more we understand this, the more we can act to restore the true freedom of Christ within the dictatorship of moral relativism. Why is that the case? Yeah. Well, because, you know, sometimes, you know, when we look at the church's moral teaching, and we know the 12 basic controversial doctrines that the church has taught, and, you know, people, you know, do not, uh, uh, the popular culture does not mm -hmm. abide, right? So that would be, for example, uh, not just abortion or, or physician-assisted suicide, euthanasia, things like that, but also uh, the church's teaching on premarital sex and on, um, you know, uh, extramarital sex, on, on homosexual uh, lifestyle, on pornography, on uh, uh, gender change, et cetera, et cetera. These issues do produce... Uh, uh, you know, a, a reaction from the popular culture. And sometimes we don't sit down and study the church's moral teaching first. Instead, what we wind up doing is we look at uh, the popular culture's view and because of the force of so social norming, right, and, and social norming just means that we're orienting our moral lives toward the perceived mainstream. And this is the way so many people uh, make their moral decisions today. They say, well, where, where's the mainstream of the culture? You know, where's it going? They don't ask whether it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. They're assuming that it's right, and they aim toward it. And, and this has been known, by the way, uh, you know, this, the, the notion of so, social norming has been well documented since the 1960s. And, and so what happens is people just knee-jerk say, well, the church is wrong on this one. The church is out of step again on this one. The church this and the church that. That is wrongo bongo. I mean, it's, it's basically, uh, you know, uh, we, we need to ask the objective question, is this right or wrong? So the, I, I wrote a third volume of the trilogy, which is not out yet, but it'll be out next year. Mm -hmm. And the third volume of the trilogy basically takes those 12 issues and it goes through and it says, okay, let's just take a look at what happens when people violate these norms that you say are so out of step from the Catholic Church and Jesus. Mm -hmm. Let's just see what happens. And uh, every single one of them, these are secular studies that are b being uh, done, not, not church studies. But these secular studies will show that what happens is, number one, a huge increase in depression, huge increase in anxiety, and a huge increase in suicides, and a huge increase in, aggressive, in aggressivity uh, in, 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 in the lifestyle. So that's the first thing. Those four things things happen in all uh, of the, the controversial uh, issues uh, and, and we're not talking uh, about you know a little bit of an increase like a 20 percent increase mm -hmm. we're talking about doubling and tripling and in the case of some lifestyles uh, for example uh, in homosexual lifestyles uh, suicides even in tolerant countries like the Netherlands right uh, increase by a factor of 5.3 times 
5.3 times. Now, you, you look at that and you go, there's something wrong here. That's right. the first thing. The, the, the second thing to notice is when you're dealing, for example, with number of premarital partners or, and, and things of that nature, you look at that and there's you know, a, a, an inverse proportion between the number of premarital po uh, partners on the one hand and then uh, on the other hand, uh, a decrease in the longevity of the marriage, a decrease in marital satisfaction during the marriage, and a decrease in monogamy during the marriage. So, I mean, this is like, you know, it's, it's there in the studies. So you, you look at what's happening. It's undermining marriage and family. Mm -hmm. you, you, so you start doing these things, and in uh, eight out of the 12 issues that I deal with, there's a true documented undermining of marriage and family. So that's another thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the third thing that going on is do these things have cultural effects well heck if you've got a huge percentage of people in 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 the in the culture that are depressed and anxious substance abuse you know tripling and quadrupling and suicides are you know can can be anywhere from uh, three times higher to five times higher etc cetera, etc cetera. you you start looking at these things and you start saying hey wait a minute this is really affecting the, you know, our the individuals in our culture but it's not just the individual Individuals that are suffering malaise and depression and anxiety and substance abuse. Mm -hmm. The culture collectively is suffering it because, of course, people talk. They get together. And when they start looking at this thing, the malaise becomes, as it were, a cultural malaise. Mm -hmm. Now, cultural malaise is not good for cultural cohesion and harmony. It causes in the, in, uh, you know, a division within the self, and the division within the self turns into a division within the family and the marriage. So it's undermining marriage and family and, and, uh, in, in so many different respects, which I, I document in good secular studies and surveys. And then when you look at uh, the undermining of marriage and family, the undermining of the individual, the, the, the individual malaise, the decrease in religion that's concomitant with all of this, uh, at the same time, you are looking at a cultural nightmare. That's what it is. It is a cultural nightmare, a, 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 a disunity within, uh, within the culture, uh, divisions within the culture, a lack of peace, a lack of respect. Of course, if you're in a state of malaise and depression and anxiety, you think you're going to be really nice to the people around you? Of course you're going to, aggressivity, we don't have to measure this. Of course it's going to come right along with the depression and anxiety package. So of course we, we put all these things together and what do we have? If you don't follow the church's teaching, you're going to see a huge increase in depression, anxiety, substance abuse, suicides, and uh, aggressivity. And then you're going to see uh, you know, uh, marriage uh, and family undermined. And by the way, the divorce rate has shot up since the 1960s. 60s has shot up by a factor of four times the, divo the, the divorce rate. Uh, I mean, this is not good for families. It's not good for children who are now split between two parents. Th this is bad. It's terrible. And of course, extramarital affairs, non-monogamy within the marriage, all the betrayal that takes place within that, all the anxiety that that causes. And then you get the, 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 the social, uh, l the lack of social cohesion. You put all that together. It's just a recipe for the entire culture literally to mm -hmm. implode not just psychologically and sociologically and spiritually but to implode on the level of actually uh, well social dissent and internal disharmony uh, I itself in other words people literally going out and being aggressive toward other people this is this is bad news it is very bad news all i can say is those 12 issues that the church has stalwartly taught even against the pressures of popular culture which i believe as i reflect in the title of that book is the ca is caused by satan he's done a magnificent preparatory work since the 1960s the sexual revolution the abortion stuff you know everything else he's done a magnificent job and, and of course the church has been standing out there taking the abuse uh, teaching the truth and taking the abuse 
case for, uh, you know, uh, for it. Uh, the social norming prog uh, process has just been grinding away and grinding away, and kids believe in the social norming pro process so deeply. Whatever the mainstream is, that's what's really normal. Right. People who are outside the mainstream are not normal. But people outside of the mainstream may be good, and, and social norming may be evil. Does somebody want to ask this question? Does somebody want to ask, what are the consequences to not emotional health? What are the consequences to spiritual well-being? What are the consequences to social disharmony? What are the consequences to marriage and family? Sorry, I'm a little adamant here, but what? I have to tell you that it's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's a travesty. And the church has ch taught the truth. It has taught goodness. It has stood up. It's taken the hits time after time. If we keep doing this, though, I I'm trying in this third volume of, uh, of the trilogy to just put it all out there. Just share the, the, the bad news, I hate to say it, of what happens when you don't follow the church's teaching. But if we don't share the bad news of what happens when you don't follow the church's teaching, we're never going to combat moral relativism. You know, it, it's one thing to insist on it. It's, we, we, have, we talk about it positively. I decided, okay, I'm going to do both. I'm going to talk about the beauty of the church's teaching, how it supports covenant love, why it supports respect and love for one another, social cohesion, cohesion and harmony. But I'm also going to share the bad news. I'm going to tell you what happens when you don't listen uh, to the, you know, Christ and the church's teaching. And of course, the bad news scenario is so significant, I think it may undermine the country and the culture itself. Not just the U.S., but I think in many right. Western cultures. I think uh, this is, the, you know, I think Satan is, is very much responsible, and we just got to wake up uh, to, to, to the social norming process and call it for what it is. It's nothing to do with any analytical tendency and nothing to do with good or evil. It's just norming ourselves to the mainstream, even if the mainstream uh, is totally wrong, totally evil. We'll norm ourselves right there like a bunch of lemmings going right off the cliff. We've got to stop it. The social media is, is promoting social norming in a major, major way. Kids right. get alienated from themselves because right. they're not following the social norm and social media. Well, uh, that's in, where you get this in, transgenderism in stuff popping up as oh. well, this kind of you, stuff going on. I've got a whole section of it in, right. in, the, in, the, in Volume 3, but, oh, yeah, I mean, it's we got to call it like it is and bring out the studies and just tell people. Well, let me ask you. What, what are you thinking about? Right, yeah. Well, they don't want to read the studies unless they agree with what they already yeah. think. But let me ask you, to some degree, we just had, uh, within the last week or so, we had like uh, one of Matthew's readings of the Beatitudes and things like that. And yeah. so sometimes you, you, you seem like, it's like, well, this is all about helping poor people and visiting people in prison. And that's what that's what Jesus really cares about because that's what he said. That's, you see me. Yeah, well, Jesus he, did care he, about he, that. But, yeah. he, yeah. you know, so we kind yeah. of, that's really what it's all about. These other yeah. These other kind of morality things having to do with sexuality and stuff like that. It doesn't seem like those yeah. were that important to our Lord. And certainly it doesn't seem mm -hmm. to be in the world we live in today that, that that's kind of where the Christian church's focus is. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> the generalization from, uh, from a particular to a universal, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is dead wrong logic. So the, the point that we want to make is, yes, Jesus was very concerned about the poor. He is very concerned with helping the marginalized. He is very concerned with helping people in prison, very much so. On the other hand, boy, if anybody's read the Sermon on, on the Mount, uh, you can tell he was very concerned about adultery, very concerned about you know, uh, premarital sexual activity, very concerned with marital infidelity, very concerned, uh, I mean, killing? I mean, uh, I mean, if Jesus knew that we would be killing millions of babies through abortion. I mean, I can tell you what he would say right now. Uh, he, he would say, you know, everybody stop everything. Stop this genocide. That's what he'd say. And he would say it in, in no uncertain terms. It's just evil beyond belief. It, 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 and, you know, to, and to justify this and to rationalize this as if this wouldn't be wrong before God, as, as if it wouldn't tear our country, our souls apart, as if it wouldn't do anything you know, to, to, to the mothers who have these abortions, as if post-abortion syndrome would never be a problem. you got to be kidding me. Of course, he would be saying right out in the front lines. And he does. 
size. I mean, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, you know, ha has all of these, uh, you know, dimensions that are there. A and the Sixth Commandment, let's face it, well, you know, the, the, the Fifth and the Sixth Commandment have been, the, you know, the ones that have been, you know, uh, toppled, mm -hmm. a a as it were, uh, in, in, in our culture. Uh, you know, the Fifth Commandment through abortion, physician-assisted suicide, and other outrages like that. A and, of course, you know, with Peter Singer and his crew uh, out there, uh, you know, shouting the rallying call for infanticide, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he, there he sits in his, his grandiose seat in Princeton. I, I mean, the, 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 the thought f for me is that has toppled. The Sixth Commandment has certainly just been all but blown up with mm -hmm. TNT. The, the, the point, of course, is that if we don't get back to our, our, our senses, though, that Fifth and Sixth Commandment, the reason they're right up there in the proscriptive commandments, uh, you know, starting with number five and six, the, the, the first two prescriptive commandments. When you really look at that, um, uh, you see that uh, Jesus, uh, I think, meant it because they're so important. Sex really is important. Marital fidelity is really important. It's not some victimless crime. I mean, inside of our souls, it matters so much. It's so powerful. Hey, just look. Uh, you know uh, mm -hmm. how you know so easily manipulated we we are, and once we uh, uh, you know just ab abuse the Creator's will for for you know sexuality, the Creator's will for marriage and family, the minute we start you know just just throwing it to the winds, notice how Satan gets his his uh, hand right into our souls and just pulls us right along with it. And of course, we don't realize it until 20 years later right. when he starts to pull the rug out from under us and just present to us Absolutely. not only our own infidelities, and we're starting but the to hatred see that of the people we've in, abused. In our country yeah. today. And that's why you wrote the book, Christ versus Satan in our daily lives. We're out of time. Uh, oh. Ask us for a blessing, Father, on the way, especially before Absolutely. this uh, Thanksgiving weekend. You bet. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord of all love, the Lord who has given us goodness through his commandments, the Lord that has presented us with the picture of goodness for our culture through the Catholic Church, may the Lord who has given us this law, which is the delight and the protection of our hearts, send forth his spirit into your hearts so that your faith may fill you with joy in this Thanksgiving season, that you may be filled with gratitude for everything that you have been given, including his teachings and his church and all that you have been personally given in your families. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Always great to see you. Have a blessed Thanksgiving. We shall see you next week. And don't forget, everybody, Father Spitzer's latest new book and all his books available through EWTN's religious catalog, of course. And this weekend, bookmark The Spider Who Saved Christmas by the one and only Raymond DeRoyo. It's a bestseller. Help him make it even better. And it's available through our catalog. we got Holy Mass from Lourdes on Thanksgiving Day. Where else should that come from? Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Advent Reflections beginning with Advent this Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern, a tradition here on EWTN taking us right into the Christmas season. And don't forget, this is Father Spitzer's universe. Have a blessed Thanksgiving, but make sure you make your way back next week and we'll see you then. God bless.